a warm welcome this afternoon uh, to everybody. This is the, the second day uh, of our summit. And as you say, this is the fourth session of the Festival of Ideas. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Jeremy Porteous. I'm the founder and chief exec of the Housing Learning Improvement Network, or Housing Lynn for short, as is familiarly known. Um, we've pulled together a really impressive week for you and a big congrats to the team behind the scenes for, for helping me do so. We have over 40 expert speakers who've given up their time to share their ideas, knowledge and expertise to help inform and improve your learning and understanding of, of the sector. Indeed, I now hear that over 600 people have now registered to join us across this week. And we anticipate that we'll attract at least two and a half thousand uh, live streams for both people watching it live now, but also again when we issue the recording. And as Sally mentioned, please do follow us on social media and uh, remark and comment uh, as we go along using hashtag housing with HLIN Summit uh, 24. Uh, you can also find the speaker profiles on our microsite that uh, she referred to. Uh, this year's summit is the fourth summit that we've gone virtual uh, since the pandemic uh, hit us, uh, but it's the 12th annual conference in, in total. Uh, and some of you who've been with us for some years remember the in-person events that we held successfully in London, uh, Birmingham. Unfortunately, we never got to Manchester because of COVID. However, formally responsible for the Department of Health's Extra Care Housing Fund, we continue to champion good quality housing and care for older adults and people with working age and with disabilities so we can support policy implementation uh, and as well influence sort of techniques, design, practice uh, and report on those, including events like uh, this afternoon. So we're looking at everything from happy to tappy and today we're looking for six specifically uh, at more directive issues around creating vibrant later living homes uh, and communities. Uh, but first of all, this session would not be possible without the support of either love without without the support of Love or Later Living. And big congrats to to Paula for your continued support of the housing. Then it, it is much appreciated, and indeed the support of all our sponsors this year, uh, both our headline sponsors and our associate sponsors. Uh, this enables us not just to run this event for free, uh, but also to support all our other learning and support activities uh, during the course of the year, you know, publishing case studies, uh, commissioning pieces of work, etc. Uh, so again, it's much appreciated. Now, turning specifically uh, to this session, can I again thank Paula and her team uh, for, for your support. Uh, it really builds on this morning's session where we looked at issues around the architecture, of, mainly around the physical fabric and the social architecture uh, of building for living for later life. And we're going to del delve more into that. Um, and we, we've got a great lineup for you. And um, this session is going to be chaired by Paula, Paula Broadbent, Managing Director of Lovell Later Living. And I'm going to hand over to her now. Welcome, Paula. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this, what seems to be um, a very interesting topic to so many of you, which we're really pleased about because it's something that um, we believe we're going to have a number of number of speakers and presentations this afternoon that you're going to find very informative and hopefully inspiring as well, because what we really aim to highlight is the importance of creating age-friendly homes and communities that don't just support people to, to live and age well, but particularly that focus of thinking, how can we create communities that really flows through into later life in making sure that, that people can absolutely live their best lives? Um, I personally have spent uh, my 30 years plus career striving to basically try and create better opportunities and outcomes for older and vulnerable people. I've been sort of driven very much by how how and what do we need to do and then finding you know a, a way to do that i strongly believe that it's only by creating places for people to live work and live life to the full that we, we're going to have any chance of succeeding in maintaining and sustaining that you know a, a, a really good balance of well-being for people but also in my experience it's essential that we do challenge the status quo. And to do that, we need to listen and learn and continually improve the environments that we create and maintain. And it's why our support for the housing lane has been there right from the start, basically. Jeremy and I have worked very closely together over all the years in looking at where the opportunities are for the learning and for the sharing 
because it's through true collaboration and partnership that, that great things really do happen. Um, we can do much more in partnership than we can do working alone. So again, it's wonderful to have such a spread of speakers today. And I'd like to thank every one of them for their contribution that they're going to put in in this afternoon. Um, from our point of view, I'm really proud to be leading the business that I'm leading now. Uh, we, whether it's it's the lifelong care ready homes that we're uh, developing for open market sale, so 55 in Scarborough, or whether it's our new chapters of housing with access to care and support, including registered nursing um, with a community independence hood, hub working with Telford and Reakin Council. It all started by understanding the challenges and aspirations of those who will live there. And then what we need to do then is take the responsibility for designing the right solutions that provide true homes and have some longevity to the community. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to the first of, of our fabulous speakers. And I have to give just a couple of apologies um, both from Julianne, who's our first speaker, and then from Mary Parsons, who unfortunately, due to circumstances completely out of their control, are not able to join us in person, but they've actually provided recordings of their presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Julianne, Professor Emirate of Nursing. Um, she is the uh, <clears throat> from the Care for Older People at the City of University of London. And... Since retiring in 2019, in addition to her ongoing research commitments, Julianne has worked as an associate of the King's Fund, co-leading the Care Home, Housing, Health and Social Care Learning Network. Together with um, Honourable Paul Burstow and Sir David Pearson, CBE, she co-chaired the Commission on the Role of Housing on the Future of Care and Support. Julianne is now the chair of the Older Persons Housing Task Force and he's going to share with us what's the evidence and where is progress to date with the task force. Hello, I'm Julian Mayer and I'm chair of the um, Older People's Housing Task Force. I want to thank you um, for inviting me to update you on the task force work at the Housing Lynn Festival for, for Ideas. Sadly, I can't be with you in person as we are meeting the equivalent task force in the Netherlands to test out some of our draft recommendations. I hope you have a wonderful summit and I look forward to hearing all about it on my return. We're now 10 months in and we'll be submitting our final report in May. And throughout our guiding star has been the Social Care Futures vision, namely, we all want to live in a place we call home with the people and things we love, in communities where we look out for one another, doing the things that matter most. The Independent Task Force has been asked to explore older people's housing in England for the lower to middle income market. This is the largest market and has previously been ignored. And we've been asked to come up with evidence informed recommendations or government to the Department of Leveling Up Housing in Communities and the Department of Health and Social Care. It's a joint initiative. And we're wanting to look at how we can support people to stay in their own homes for as long as possible, if that's what they want. How we can enable them to right size to more age appropriate housing, to release family homes, if that's what they want and how we can expand both the quality and quantity of the older people's housing market. We recognise that age appropriate housing can enhance well-being and prevent ill health, potentially saving money for the health and social care services and also releasing family homes to help ease the general housing crisis. We are doing this work um, in the context of a diverse and ageing population. Indeed, 8% of UK residents aged over 65 were born outside the UK. So we're going to need a variety of different housing models. 91% of older people actually live in mainstream housing. So we're not just going to be focused on specialist housing, but also mainstream, both 
new build and existing adaptation. 90% of 65 to 79 year olds actually live in underoccupied housing. And so we do hope that we can actually hope to assist with the general housing crisis. Poor housing is negatively impacting health and well-being. Indeed, 15% of older households live in homes that fail to meet the decent home standard. And 52% of older people live alone with lower well-being compared with those who live with others. And we know that preventable ill health is adding to the unnecessary costs to the NHS, which is already overstretched and is going to get worse if we're not more proactive in managing our ageing population. People are not aware of the benefits of specialist housing and research has shown that housing with care results in fewer visits to the GP and from community nurses and reduction in ambulance call outs, shorter unplanned hospital stays. So we're really thinking about how we can share information, advice and, and offer advocacy not just to older people, um, the public, but also the professionals who work with them. And we're mindful that there is a troubling lack of supply. At present, in terms of age appropriate housing, we're currently building 7,000 older people units annually. But it is estimated that to meet the needs of the ageing population, we should be building 30 to 50,000. So we really do need to address this issue. So what have we been doing? Well, the task force has sought to put the opinions, preferences and priorities of older people and their families at the centre of its work. And we've travelled um, the country to access the lived experience of older people um, and visited nearly 30 sites. We've seen wonderful examples of later living housing. Um, not just specialist older people's housing, but also community led models such as co-housing and um, shared lives. We've conducted a number of surveys with various stakeholders and had an online call for evidence, which resulted in 178 responses from local authorities, charities, professional bodies and individuals. We've had a series of roundtables for professionals and system leaders across housing, health and social care to test out our early thinking and our interim recommendations. I've also had one to one conversations with over 100 key industry leaders um, from across the sector to better understand its complexity, gauge different perspectives and access innovative models of best practice. And we've also commissioned research. We're currently undertaking focus groups with adults aged 55 plus living across different parts of England and according to a range of demographic characteristics to further understand what barriers and enablers are, the older, uh, are for older people when accessing appropriate housing in later life. This is being complemented by desktop research which is exploring what is known about what older people want and what they are prepared to pay for when it comes to their housing choices when they're looking to move. And in addition, we've been analysing 2000 planning applications for older people's um, sites to gain a better understanding of the patterns and trends in success or otherwise of planning applications. In terms of how we've organised the work in the first phase, um, we worked around three strands, people, products and place, with co-leads for each work stream. By the midpoint, we had a clear vision and had been um, came up with a framework linked to 10 key recommendations. And in the second phase, which is largely organised around these 10 recommendations, um, with co-leads for each of them, we are nuancing, testing and strengthening these recommendations with underpinning evidence. This is a highly collaborative initiative and the 19 task force members have often worked alongside busy day jobs across work streams and across recommendations to ensure that we've got joined up thinking. The work is very much a shared endeavour with me playing a supportive and coordinating role, ensuring delivery of the recommendations on time and being the final arbitrator 
where different perspectives cannot easily be resolved. I am indebted to the ministers in DLUC and DHSC for setting up the task force and also the task force members for sharing their experience and expertise and the secretariat for supporting us in our work. But above all, I am grateful for all those who have contributed to our thinking. As we move to the end point, we are looking at the under underpinning evidence and exploring what is needed to deliver a people centred approach to addressing older people's housing needs. How can we build public trust in older people's housing and ensure consumer protection? What systems are needed to help older people get the information and advice and advocacy that they need when they're making housing decisions? How can we help older people and those who work with them to think housing? What incentives are needed to enhance the viability of the older people's housing sector? What should guidance look like on age and friendly and age and dementia friendly design um, and or, or retrofit standards. How can national leadership enhance visibility and profile of older people's housing? What steps or incentives are needed to enhance age and dementia friendly placemaking in local areas? How can we develop a coordinated and multidisciplinary approach to innovation, research and development on older people's housing? and also education? And how can we attract new sources of investment into the sector to ensure scalable development? So you can see we are taking a broad approach. And I hope very much that you will continue to engage with us. And if there is more that you want to share, in particular robust evidence to support key recommendations to government that's going to provide a step change in older people's housing that offers more choice to older people in later life. We want to hear from you. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you for all your support. And I wish you some interesting conversations in the housing of Festival of Ideas. I'm really sorry to be missing it. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you would all join me if, if Julianne was here to say, um, thank you very much. But really, really insightful to understand in greater detail the, the depth, really, of, of what the task force has taken on board and the amount of work that's already taken place as part of those first recommendations. I think what I would urge is that uh, those of you out there in the sector that do have some, you know, great examples of what has made difference to people's lives and where we can work more effectively to do more, I would urge that, that we all share that with the task force. We've got still got opportunity before the report goes in May, and I'm sure Julianne would be saying the same if she was here with us today. So I'm, I'm going to pass on to, to the next speaker, just leaving really that reflection of what Julia, Julianne pointed out there, which was around the sort of that diversity of housing models. And I think that that's absolutely great that, that what the task force is doing is looking at the place as a whole and not just specifically those that are putting you know, the most extreme pressure on, on health and social care budgets. So the next presentation, uh, again, is from a speaker, and I do promise there are speakers here in person today, but this again is from um, a speaker who unfortunately cannot be, be with us, and, and Mary does explain herself in the, in the presentation, so I, I won't waste time um, talking through why she can't be with us. But Mary Parsons is the National Regeneration and Partnerships Director uh, and Divisional Board Member at Lovell Partnerships. And she's been um, with the Morgan Sindel Group since 2020. Prior to that, um, Mary was, was main um, group board member at Places for People, where she was responsible for large scale developments and new places agenda. Uh, and so Mary's brought that experience to Lovell, where she has responsibility for strategic joint ventures with the public sector. But Mary also is the divisional board member uh, who has the responsibility for, for my business, for the later living business within Lovell. So, so Mary's going to share her, her thoughts with, with everybody today. Um, and so over to Mary, gentlemen.
I'm really sorry that I can't be uh, with you live today. Uh, my daughter's first baby is due any time. So if you are watching this as a pre-record, it suggests it's probably quite imminent. And I'm sharing that I'm hopefully going to to become a grand for the first time not only to apologize for not being able to to be there even virtually in person today but also because it started to really shape some of the thinking of what i wanted to say today because it was noticeable that actually some people not everyone by any means but some started to treat me a little bit differently when they heard about this uh, milestone in my life i had a colleague say a couple of weeks ago wow does that mean you're going to retire now no, I'm still going to have to work probably another 10 to 15 years. And even at the hairdressers, having my hair rinsed, when one of the girls went, oh, that's so exciting. Now, are you going to change the colour from red? And basically, no, I'm not. Because just because I may be getting older, I am still me. As Jenny Joseph said in a poem, I, when I am an old woman, I shall wear purple and a red hat. I already do. I don't see why I would need to change. And I saw this on social media. And I thought, yes, I really want to be this dude in the future. Maybe with slightly less beard, but absolutely loving life. As my father-in-law said when he was being told off by his daughter that, Dad, you're nearly 90, he turned around and went, not up here, I'm not. And so why don't we start hashtag I'm still me? Because it may have been originally set up for people with dementia, but actually it applies to anyone that wants to live the life that they've always had. And when we're creating places... Why can't we create them where people can not only age well, but live life well as well? And so, first thing about how we start to treat people's housing needs as they get older is we lump everyone over the age of 55 into one big pot, which always feels a bit perverse, because then actually what we want to do is neatly slice them into little groups. And it's a little bit like the seaside machine when you drop a coin in the top and it pings its way through till it drops neatly into a box. And I'm not knocking the happy model because it really is the most useful map of the market we have. It may highlight a couple of areas where there, there might be gaps in the market and they're ones that, that Love will later live in are looking at. But setting aside the ones on the right in red and orange where people's health and, and care needs really start to dictate where they live. All of the others define a series of quite discreet housing products that people should neatly drop into. But what happens if you don't or you don't want to neatly fit in a box as you get older? What are your choices and what are your flexibilities? This was an Australian couple who decided to just go for it and live on cruise ships for the rest of their lives. And actually, a good few years ago, I was doing a development with a, a developer that was owned by a Catholic priest. And he was already planning this for his retirement because he said it's cheaper than residential care, better food, always different people and company, and better medical facilities than the NHS. And this gent probably knew because he'd started by setting up, actually, a series of, a small chain of care homes, um, hugely profitable, very successful, where he had nuns delivering the care. And he said, not just because of the, the quality of the care they provide, but he didn't actually have to pay them. But that one's probably another story. But how we promote the places we create inevitably make people feel as if it's an old folks home it makes people feel old instead of making them feel positive and even excited about a new chapter like this new zealand example is trying to do believe me i'm not ready for an old folks home and i probably never will be so this is sandcastles in scarborough which is lovell later living's first um homes for sale and it's already been planned as part of a bigger community, so it's not just a standalone place. But you'd look at it and think, ah, bungalows by the seaside, I know who's going to live there. But actually, these are our, a selection of our actual first customers. And when you look at them, the spread of their age, 
the spread of their circumstance, their geography, and their reasons for moving there are all very, very different. And so what we try to create in Lovell Layer to Live In are homes that people can really make their own, a blank canvas, but something that can reflect who they are now with a view to having a safety net for the future. But above all, in a place where they want to live, on a street where they can be with or make new friends. And it's not just about they need a bungalow. You know, one of my best friend's moms, Val, she's now in her 80s. She's lived in a bungalow for over 40 years, but she's now moving into a retirement development, basically because she's achingly lonely. One of the biggest challenges we face in our later years. So we are really catering for, for two groups in the market those driven by choice-based decisions and those driven by needs-based. And if we then actually think about how accessible the market is for them, if we look at the general needs market, which can be very inaccessible, you can see there is a spread of tenure choices. But in layer to live in, there's far less. You've got affordable and extra care, maybe with a bit of shared ownership at one end. You've then got market sale up to higher end, but private ownership at the top end. There's very, very little choice in the middle. And if you map out a lot of the main players roughly by tenure and the level of, of care and support they provide, no other market has gaps this big with so many people not being catered for. Because this isn't just about downsizing. What happens if you have some or average equity in an average home. And what about if you rent? You're highly unlikely to be able to access affordable housing and your choices are so limited. So this was NHF research last year. Many renters are facing the most insecure old age of anyone. Not only are they potentially facing it in accommodation that's not suitable for them, but how are they going to afford it? So as well as thinking about affordable housing products, we need to think about how we can make the market more affordable and more accessible for everyone. And for me, that starts with thinking differently about how we plan for older people in our communities. I'm sure we've all seen sites being marketed like this, where you carve off an extra care as a separate development, often delivered completely separately, often two separate places, two separate land transactions or in a bigger master plan where you stick it on the edge. I mean, okay, this one actually isn't too bad if you look closely because the retirement development is by public transport and retail, but it still feels like it's on the margins and we need to change that. So how can we create and plan truly intergenerational places? This was a great model from an earlier housing Lynn talk, but it makes it look like it's very complicated. And in reality, it doesn't have to be if we take a few simple steps. First of all, all retirement development tends to be exclusive. And that doesn't mean it's like top end expensive, even extra care, everything, everything looks inwards. It's quite introspective. Why not point the restaurant, the hairdressers, the coffee shops, the facilities outwards. So actually not only do they draw people in from the wider community and be genuinely inclusive, but you'd also make them more viable as well as more vibrant. And this was an example that Lovell uh, was looking at where you can see on the, the one master plan, you've got the purple adult social care next to the local center. So it is central to things. But we wanted to go a bit further and say, this isn't just about zoning it. It's how do we knit it in to the fabric of the place? So we suggested that we move it right into the thick of it, where everyone in the community can come together for schools, for shops, for activities, for leisure, for living. People pass through and they bring that intensity and vibrancy of place. So this really is at the heart of Lovell's placemaking approach and why later living is so important to it. Because instead of locating the later living developments next to the community heart, we want them to become part of a beating, vibrant community heart. 
So for me, if we are really going to go from products to thinking about place, it's also how we start to define and describe them. So we know that there are going to be people whose needs dictate where they live, but there's people whose choices are not being met in the market. We need to not just think in 10 years in terms of much needed affordable housing, but how do we make living their lives more affordable for people? We talk about housing with care. Can we start from a placemaking point of view, really plan places that care so that there's not just age appropriate housing, there's a life appropriate environment. Let's stop thinking of old folks and start welcoming new folks from all ages into our communities so that they stop being exclusive and start being genuine, genuinely inclusive. Lifetime homes are great, but what we really need to start thinking about are lifelong places. And sorry, Paula, we need to stop talking about later living and just realize we're talking about living because hashtag I'm still me. And I always like to end with a quote. And this one happens to have been from my favorite poem since I was 16 or 17 years old. Uh, Andrew Marvell to his coy mistress. And it may have been a real 17th century metaphysical conceit for some chap trying to get his girlfriend into bed. But it is the most wonderful philosophy for our later years. Because at our back, we may always hear time's winged chariot coming near. But as he said, we cannot make our son stand still, but we can make him run. And I hope for all of our new Sandcastles residents, they enjoy many marvellous Scarborough sunsets for many years to come. And thank you again for listening. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the session. Well, again, um, I'm sure that if Mary was here, you'd all join me. Um, and I can see a lot of hands and thumbs going up at the other side of the screen. Uh, as always, very, very thought provoking. And I think that that's what, what, in a sense, we're here to do, which is where we, we set the scene to start with. But some of the key points that I'll sort of really pick up there is, you know, yes, there is far less choice than later living, but Mary's absolutely quite right in that final comment. You know, we, we shouldn't be just thinking later living. We should be thinking about that longevity of the communities that we create to allow people to live no matter what their age is through to whatever age they want to continue living there. Um, and I think the other key thing here for me that I'd like to take through in, into, into the next uh, speaker session is around those ha how, how do we ensure that it isn't about fitting neatly into a box but it is about those intergenerational places that actually knits in any specialist requirement that there, there may be. So I'd sort of leaving you with that thought, I'd like to move on and, and introduce Bob Tomlinson. Bob is the founder of Living Villages, and Bob was designer and developer of the, the Wintles in Bishop's Castle, Shrotsborough, and is the director of Village Makers, currently developing several inclusive integrated schemes. Now, Bob's bringing 20 years experience of research in designing and building better places, which he believes has developed a system to deliver greater social, environmental and economic van value. Uh, Bob's also put a, a blog, which is on the, the Housing Link website of designing a neighborhood for connectedness. And, and that can be found, as I say, on the Housing Link website. So if you're ready, Bob, I'll hand over to you. So, <clears throat> are we there? Not just yet. <laughs> <laughs> it worked so well in rehearsal. Oh, goodness. Are we there? Nope. No, it's nope. not showing yet. Do you want Jerome to share or one last go? Are you, uh, what are you seeing there? Are you seeing me or are you seeing the screen? We're just, we're seeing you. You're seeing me. Um, well, shall I say hello and welcome? Does hello. everyone else seeing me? That's what I don't know. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so everyone else is seeing me. <laughs> well, yeah. good afternoon, everyone else then. And I've got to say thank you very much to for giving me the time to do this. 
and also particularly to Jeremy, who stumbled across the Wintels a few months ago and decided it might be worth having a look at. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen now. And what do we see? Do we see? Um, yeah, that's perfect. There we go. Great. Perfect for you, but not for me. So I've got to work this out. OK, um, that's me. Uh, that's who I am. Um, so again, thank you very much also to Level Later Living for uh, sponsoring this session, but also providing these facts, which I was quite shocked by. I didn't realize that there were so many people who really wanted to move. That's quite a, an extraordinary figure there. And for those who are also unable to move, how many lonely, cold and ill uh, people that you have living in places that they want to move out of, um, which is a very, very sad thing. And I'm wondering why that happens. Um, and I think it's probably because of this, is that the way that we deliver housing generally or have delivered housing recently is, to, is by the large house builders targeting one particular market. It's the one that makes them the most money and it's the one that makes them the mo obviously the most profit. But they're able to target the so-called nuclear family and then walk away from the site, not having to deal with any of the social, economic or climatic problems, which which happened because of the type of product which has been delivered. And so um, over the years, we've developed a different design philosophy to look at how we could change that. And what I want to do with you this afternoon, very quickly is just go through that and then base it on the research that we've done. So fundamentally, if you're going to build something somewhere and you want it to last and be sustainable, then look around you and see places that have several generations living in them, places that are loved and cared for, and places that have that element of, of, of being liked. Well, well loved is the term I think I'd use the most. But what is it that makes them work? Is it the relationship between the houses and the open space? Is it the nature of the tenure? Is it the, the materials they're made out of? Is it the orientation to the sun or whatever? You analyze those but then make it better, obviously improve the energy efficiency, make it compliant and also look at the affordability um, without destroying those fundamental elements that made it uh, successful and attractive in the first place. And then of course, you have to look at the, um, the viability, the buildability of that and the ways in which those places can actually be delivered because there's no point designing something if it's not gonna be able to be delivered. And so um, we, developed a lot of our experience through working in this place called Bishop's Castle, which is a small medieval hill town in South Shropshire. And this is the high street. As you can see, it's quite a quite a sort of characterful sort of place. And in the um, early 2000s, the local farmer got himself planning consent for 40 units on the edge of town. And a group of people in Bishop's Castle decided that they didn't want to see in anywhere housing estate built on that. And so rather than just write angry letters to the planning officer, we decided to try and do something about it ourselves. So we formed the Living Village Trust and we found ourselves a patron or two and we eventually ended up buying the site. But having done that, we really had to think why we were doing it. And, and the fundamental reason was that Bishop's Castle as a small town actually works very, very well. It's very resilient. It's very good for old people. It's It has that very strong sense of community that just seems to be a very natural thing. And we started to look at why that worked, whereas in other places it didn't work. Fundamental one was the, um, the way it's a medieval hill town, so it wasn't designed for motor vehicles. That means there are uh, a low volume, there is a low volume of vehicles, but it's also traveling quite slowly. So you get this sort of thing happen on the high street. There's, there's people around uh, who look after this, there's people walking up and down the street without fearing being run over. So this is the sort of thing that happens. The housing um, also tends to be in friendly streets in that here you have a direct connection between the street, again, low, low volumes of traffic, but also quite characterful housing that despite its fact the fact that it's full of damp and dry rot and nowhere to park and all the rest of it was attracting quite high prices per square foot because people really just wanted to live in that so in order to make our project viable we had to take account of that look at those important elements that were being delivered there and how can we improve those and make them better um the other thing about bishop's castle it has these shortcuts for pedestrians uh, between the streets um and what that really means is that if it's a way to get from A to B, 
um, that is quicker by foot than it would be if you drove your car and then tried to park at the other end. So that was another important element into in the way that the 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 townscape is in, in interrelated and interactive because as you walk, you then meet up with people and that's where conversation starts. But also you're incentivized to do that because it's quicker and more interesting. And so there's a there's a resilient community. It's not a big town, it's quite isolated, but it's a very strong community, which I believe is supported by these things. So we didn't want to see something like this built on the outskirts of it. And that was the origin of our uh, protest, which then turned into, heck, we've bought it, we've got to do something about it. What can we do? Why, uh, why, uh, why is it going to be different? So with the, the design brief for the Wentels, the key things were that it had to be pedestrian priority. Obviously, there's a lot of compliance to be dealt with there, but it's very important to have those safe spaces. The other thing was lifetime homes. If someone's going to live there, we wanted it to be lived in for many generations. So we made the houses as flexible as possible. And we wanted them to be energy efficient, eco-friendly, of course, because that's the sort of thing you do. And this is an example. Of, this is one of the phases of what we built. Um, key thing, places, the spaces between the buildings were uh, designed to be used by people and not be used by cars. Now, ordinarily, a cluster like this would have a strip of black top down the middle of it and a turning head at the end and be filled with cars. Instead, it's a place where people can meet each other and, and relax or whatever. That doesn't mean to say that cars are excluded from the development. You still have to get emergency vehicles and removal lorries and Tesco delivery vans in, but they can't park there. When people park, they park outside the clusters, um, either behind the houses or on the edge of the clusters. Not everybody at the Wentels has a silver car, but it looks like it from this uh, from this slide. Um, we We... Within the design, we did these pedestrian stroke cycleway pathways in the same way as it happens in Bishop's Castle. This is the way you get from A to B. Um, and, um, um, the, and, and this encourages people to leave their car at home. And also the public spaces are all uh, controlled and owned by the residents themselves. So they look after them, they decide what's going to be done with them and they use them a lot, which is sometimes a contrast to the usual thing that happens with a local authority who come in and gang mow it every month or so, and it gets neglected. But it's very important that you have that ownership process there. Um, open porches, very important to provide a transition space between the private and the public, so that you have that gentle, uh, that gentle interaction between people. So you don't need to invite somebody into your house and you don't need to leave them standing outside in the rain, you can use the porch. Um, we encourage eccentricity. It was a early, uh, version of custom build here so people were able to do that um, and we provided that sort of thing we allowed that sort of thing to happen which which brings it to life um, another key element was that we worked in the layout design with the topography of the site rather than put in the roads and then plonk the houses alongside them in some sort of grid pattern two things happen there one is you have a lot less cut and fill because the houses fit and the second thing is that you are actually able to improve the density quite a lot which improves the viability um, and there's a final shot of that. And these people were the ones who became our customers. It wasn't what we intended. We intended just to, to deliver a new neighborhood for Bishop's Castle, but it became very popular with these guys who moved in and when they were 50 plus and they're still there now. So they're, six, they're 70, 80 plus years old generally. Um, and it seemingly worked very well. They, it's a very uh, strong, neighborhood a very strong community they also contribute enormously to the wider community of bishop's castle and there's an awful lot of this going on and so fundamentally through building that what have we learned well we first of all i suppose we've responded to the, some of the demands that's been identified earlier on but because of that um the prices went up a lot not necessarily profit for us but when the houses were resold if they were at all were actually being sold for a lot more than the local similar housing so it became unaffordable which is a which is something that's difficult to deal with and the high average age is great but it would be much better if it was intergenerational if there was younger families young children and so on uh, in that neighborhood um because i think that older people and younger families actually work very well together it's quite a natural thing it happens in the old part of bishop's castle because there isn't that stress on house pricing within the old house older places so um We've applied that design philosophy to um, 
uh, almshouses, because you can see that almshouses are actually something that has a very, very long history of sustainability. And so we began to look at why they work and see if they might be a solution to some of these problems. Um, so when we look to those, how can we improve them? How can we make them better? The usual story of energy efficiency and maintenance and so on. And also how can they be delivered? There's another important element to, to this and it's all very well to have theories, but how are you gonna get these things delivered? And when we look at it, you know, a thousand years of, of proof, um, what is it that makes them work? Well, we started to look at that and how can we improve them? Um, to, one of the interesting things about arms houses, I'm sure I'm telling everyone I had to suck eggs here, but uh, the, they're quite often or nearly always locally controlled charities, which works well with parish councillors and district council planning committees. And so we now have a number of landowners who are looking at seeing if they can get exception site permissions for an arms house type of development in a particular district. And we've now married that with offsite manufacturer to see how we can deliver them. And some of this work on the on the drawing board is that we've got a simple unit that can go from one bed up to three or four beds to provide all of that uh, accommodation. Um, the one on the right is the three to four better. The one on the left is the one to two bed. And when we put them together uh, in, in an area which is essentially a cluster that surrounds a pedestrian priority environment, this is one that's being designed for um, East Sussex at the moment, um, uh, together with a bit of variation and adjusting to the topography of the site. This is the sort of thing that we think that we can deliver. And now one of the things that's happened to me is I've run out of my timings. My timing counter has gone somewhere. So that's the last slide and it's goodbye to me and from me and uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that, Bob. I'm sure that again, everybody will agree. Really insightful. And I think that the sort of the interesting thing for me that I, I really sort of take from it is that although you didn't, in a sense, start the journey of, of trying to design to reach out to a certain cohort of, of people, by default, in a sense, that's what you ended up doing. And that's that's I think that's really, really interesting. I think I think it's it's something that um, you're absolutely right. It, it's putting that character, it's putting that thought, and it's putting that that really thinking and the voice of the customer, isn't it, um, into it? Because ultimately, it, it's about who who's going to live in these communities for the next, hopefully, century to come. You know, when we talk about harms houses. So, um, so thank you so much for, for that. And I'm sure there will be lots of questions. Uh, I could see things popping up on the screen as as you were going through that. Um, and I think, you know, the sort of the final point there was about sort of actually embracing some of the old traditional models and bringing them through in the 21st century. And I think, again, that's absolutely key. Not everything's broken that's had to change or has changed, is it? Some things we've just changed. So, um, so, so yes, thank you so much. I'd like to introduce now our final speaker for today who's Alex Ely, is the founding director of May, a London-based architect and urban design studio. Uh, the studio has established an international reputation for sustainable architecture and urbanism, including the design of innovative housing, uh, especially related to living and social infrastructure. And Alex leads that design direction uh, and has won numerous awards, including the Sterling Prize 2023 for the John Morden Centre and Housing Architect 2022. So, so Alex also advises the Mayor of London on urban and planning policy. And, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us as final speaker this afternoon, Alex. Thank you, Paula. Um, hopefully I'm now sharing my screen. Um, great, well, uh, thank you. I very much think, um, this will follow on nicely from Mary and Bob's presentation. It picks up on some of the themes already discussed, albeit probably uh, covering a much more urban uh, context. So Mary mentioned that um, there are issues in terms of our built environment and uh, health impacts in later life. She's particularly signaled out loneliness, but actually, I think, and forgive me for this very dense slide, I don't necessarily expect everyone to see the detail, but as built environment professionals, I'm acutely aware that every decision I make has um, an impact on our quality of life. 
and our mental and our physical health. And um, it, this will um, so have a bearing on how we choose to design our uh, environments. And if I just pick out a couple of issues, for example, um, the quality of light within a home will affect our mental health. So it might lead to depression, uh, lack of motivation. Uh, we know that in schools, it particularly leads to kind of a, a, a low performance, but equally in uh, later life, it's going to uh, be demotivating. Our access to open space and leisure uh, is also going to uh, debilitate us in terms of our physical health, uh, our mental well-being, uh, and also our, our, our development. Or if we think about um, the, the sort of location of where we're building and very much picking up Bob, Bob, Bob's point about um, neighbourhood uh, living, if we don't have access to good facilities, uh, we're going to reduce our physical functional health uh, and, again, our, our mental well-being. So I'm really curious and interested in this synergy between a good placemaking and a good life. And there's evidence that the relationship um, between social relationships and our mortality uh, is very different where we have uh, good communities. So communities with strong social relationships are likely to remain uh, alive longer than similar individuals with poor social relationships. And I think the true measure of any society can really be found in how we treat our most vulnerable. Um, we know that over 1 million people with care needs in the UK receive no formal or informal support. Um, I apologize, I've got a bar across this slide. So hopefully you'll see in the, the full slide or as I um, just picking yeah, back we're not, on. We're not seeing a bar, Alex. No, great. All right. Thank you. Um, now, I think one thing to just bear in mind that if we can create better environments for helping us thrive in later life, it also has a very direct knock on effect to the costs of uh, care and particularly social care. And I think we need to be creating environments whereby actually. We, if people can uh, live more independently longer with the social networks and support around us, then arguably we're going to lead, uh, need close care for a much shorter period uh, in our light, later life. So the goal in, in built environment professionals is to get everyone on that top curve where we live a good life independently uh, in, the, in the last years of our life, and then only need close care in the very last few months. Sadly, too often, most of us are on the blue curve. And actually, because we live in inhabitable or are in hostile um, environments, we end up uh, needing care for much longer, which comes at a huge cost. So in a more urban situation, I think what uh, we really need to try and encourage is development, and Mary's touched on this, uh, as has Bob, um, thinking about lifetime neighbourhoods, where we have access to not just multi-generational housing, but access to services, to healthcare, to retail, to social infrastructure, all on our doorstep. Um, there was a report recently about a staggering drop in public bus transport provision. And that's leaving many isolated from the services they need. If we continue to create sprawling neighbourhoods, then we uh, really will struggle to support uh, our needs in later life. So this diagram from the Mayor's Design Advisory Group kind of illustrates the sort of neighbourhoods that we really want to encourage, access to healthcare, cultural facilities, parks, and so on. And in our own small way, we've been uh, considering this on a number of urban projects in um, uh, in Greater London. And the first uh, for City of Westminster, this is a later living scheme, a very dense urban centre, but part of the scheme included a new health uh, care facility, a community hub with um, police services, with dental clinic, with uh, clinical services, with general needs housing. And then this uh, happy housing uh, designed above a business enterprise space and right on the doorstep of the very vibrant and active Church Street. Or at the Aylesbury Estate, we've been designing some multi-generational housing here. In pink, it has extra care facilities. Uh, in green, a community centre. 
and then more family general uh, needs living, all designed around uh, a common courtyard. Um, and, and then also thinking at the other end of the spectrum, how uh, we can design much higher end uh, later living to encourage uh, families or, or rather uh, those whose families have moved away to downsize from large family house, houses into good quality um, uh, housing that supports them independently, but can be care ready and uh, provide that additional support when they need it. Now, picking up specifically on the theme of uh, loneliness, we recognise that that's a public health issue. It can increase the risk of heart disease, of stroke, dementia. And it was this um, reflection that prompted uh, the commissioning of the John Morden Centre by our client, um, David Rutherford-Jones at Morden College in South London. Uh, Morden College is a care home with... Um, an arms house uh, built in 1695 and there was a need to provide a sort of a central hub for the residents 300 residents who were missing the sort of facilities that allowed them to come together and support each other and uh, this building uh, has a health center it has arts rooms crafts room a, a cafe uh, restaurant um, here's the terrace that's just off the cafe. It has a theatre space, which is retrofitted in an old building. And the residents are very um, empowered to use the building in their own way and uh, set up activities and create events for their own needs. Uh, this is a cafe space where many residents will come once a day for a main meal, and then they can um, eat more independently at their, in their own flats. Uh, at other times of the day, but it's really become a space of conviviality. And there's always this sense of connection here. You see the art room uh, from one space to the other. So you're always aware of other activities going on. And actually it's notably, it's been evident that a lot of residents have um, taken part in activities that they might not have otherwise considered and um, been embracing some of the um, events and uh, things either provided by the college, by, by the uh, care staff of the college, or by uh, the residents themselves. So just a bit of context, um, Morden College is this wonderful campus grounds in uh, Blackheath. Uh, the original arms house was, is attributed to Christopher Wren, uh, built in 1695. And it has this kind of wonderful grounds where over the centuries, the college has built additional homes for uh, residents. And as I say, it now has up to 300 residents. And we were given this uh, site at the edge, dotted in red, a car park and filled with some port cabins to build this new facility. But the almshouse itself, a bit like the examples Bob was showing, are these kind of beautiful uh, quadrangle arrangement with, um, in this case, 40 homes around the quad, very sort of paternalistic model, everyone looking onto this green space in the middle and it has a, a chapel attached to it it had uh the uh the um uh, caretaker's house as well and a dining hall uh, but there was lacking a sort of central facility that could uh, provide that um more communal space and so here in the bottom left of the uh, plan shows the new uh john morden center uh, which takes on some of the cues from the quadrangle, it also picks up the idea of a cloister, but actually it we the cloister weaves its way around the existing landscape. Um, and then the appendages that you see in the original quadrangle, like the chapel in our building become the new health center and other facilities. So uh, you see the synergy on the left between the quadrangle from the arms house and the new John Morden center uh, and the colonnade that runs through it with these brick pavilions that house the different functions of the building. So here in plan is the, the cloister that acts as a colonnade and joins up all the functions of the building. Uh, you then have the, the functions in their own pavilions. Uh, so the health center in the top, uh, a lounge and reception, a little shop for conveniences, uh, a well-being suite for hairdressing, for a nail, a nail bar and so on and then the arts room, which is already uh, proving kind of um, too small, there's so much demand, um, which was un un unanticipated. 
uh, very much proving the success of the, the the building and then the cafe and then the theatre space. And then they're all interlinked by these smaller gardens. So you're always aware of nature. And as you move through the building, you always have this sense that you're looking out at landscape and your quality of life is kind of enriched by the synergy between the building on the one hand feeling always um, connected with the landscape. And then you get these views from one room across another out to another. Uh, so wherever you are within the building, you're always having a sense of orientation and a sense of uh, nature. Um, and then just to finish with a few photos of uh, the building, this is the main entrance where you can see you cross a threshold and there's a small garden on the right-hand side and the building on the left is the health centre. Um, and then on the other side, it takes on a very different characteristic. The, the colonnade wraps around this lovely centenary cedar tree. It's grass, grass roofed. It's all timber construction, so it's low embodied carbon, low operational carbon. It passively, passively ventilates, um, passively cools. The big overhanging eaves provide uh, solar shading in summer uh, and um, insulation in winter. And then the terrace. Uh, off the uh, cafe, which becomes very active in uh, summer. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the sort of connection between different functions. So here you see uh, the cafe, you see out to the courtyard on the left uh, and a bit of landscape and through to the art room uh, on the right. And then some of the activities taking place. And it's been really evident that every time I visit that residents feel really uh, empowered by this building their quality of life is notably improved and residents who otherwise would have felt isolated uh, have a sense of purpose and uh, come to this building to connect with friends, to see neighbours and take part in different activities. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for sharing, um, not, not just around the John Morden Centre, but also um, the insight into you know, the, how important it is, as Mary described, uh, and Bob as well, about that the thought that needs to go in right from putting pen to paper in the first place and how you need to think about, about spanning that out. I mean, hopefully what is provided this afternoon with the speakers that um, have, have provided their time and input into this afternoon's session is, is that there's some sort of really thought-provoking things there that I've seen a number of the chats going up and down the screen where you know people have been inspired by it and, and absolutely agreeing with it whereas you know there are some comments as well that will also challenge that of whether you know is it is it possible to do and is it right and is it you know is it a case of one size fits all or not so I think that what that always describes to me is is that you know all of us now that are on this call will, will live in different environments. What we value will be different to each of us. And I think that that's the one thing that we have to hold on to and not lose sight of. You know, and I think what, what's absolutely valuable here and linking this back to the older person's task force and around the focus groups as well is this isn't just about us as professionals sharing our experience and our opinion. It has to be about how are we reaching out to the general public? How are we engaging with people themselves? And how are we listening to what's important to them? And sometimes because you know you haven't had sight of these, you know, sort of some really marvelous examples versus some, you know, pretty much run of the mill of where, in a sense, the housing market has driven house builders over the last few decades to increase density, to be driven by profits, to create, in a sense, soulless places. And some people have known no difference. So, so how do we engage effectively with people by educating as well, by sharing that there, there is the, these better opportunities? Um, but I think, I think what's been clear to me is it's just built on that whole um, emphasis that we've talked about at numerous summits, Jeremy, haven't we, where we've 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 you know really broached this topic and talked about well well how how can we shape them future communities when there definitely is not one size fits all and there definitely does need to be 
an approach that is intergenerational because actually what is absolutely clear is that we should be thinking more about how do we influence the housing standards full stop because let's face it having a stepless entry is just as powerful and empowering to a mum with a push chair as it is to somebody who's dependent on a walking frame or a wheelchair so why should it be any you know age shouldn't be the thing but i'm afraid it, it's it's policy often that drives us into compartmentalizing things you know if i use mary put sandcastles up there from from uh, scarborough of our development which i've shared with with through the housing line at, at many sort of um, conferences previously when it was first in the making as a regeneration plan of 1350 new homes with an extra care housing scheme the first development that was on that site, we master plan that purposely that way to connect the two, exi one existing community with a new development that was coming along. So it was that connectivity, it was that hub. Alongside it was the new primary school, you know, and my scheme now sits the other side of that primary school, you know, with the family housing all around it. But the challenges are, do I drive on that development and think, oh gosh, Yes, I do in certain places, because unfortunately planning policy and the policies in that local authority at that time drove us to make certain decisions. And so I think that would be my sort of takeaway as well. And if Julian was on the call and I'll be making sure that I, I pass this through to Julian when we meet, is to be saying, you know, what also needs to come out of the older person's task force recommendations is that empowerment. We've heard that a lot this afternoon about this is about empowering people to live, you know, not just to develop appropriate housing, but to live in appropriate housing, to live in a, in a, in a meaningful, you know, and connective community, a community that empowers people, provides people with safe social space. And in, in return, people will live well, will live better, which, which then creates that whole benefit, not just to them as individuals, but to the whole wider local economy. And I think that needs to, it absolutely needs to come out of the old person task force. And we need to think about not just how we can educate and guide, but there is going to need to be some incentivization. You know, Lord Best talks a lot about every, every person that we inspire to move out in later life of a family home frees up approximately two and a half family homes. So how can we create communities that, yes, are going to inspire, but do that in a way that it, it is intergenerational, so it's more pockets, it's more set within, it's more integrated rather than segregated. So that's where I'm going to finish. I'm going to hand back to Jeremy so that we can run through the questions and answers. We've got a good 20 minutes to go through that before we then finish up for the day. And I genuinely do hope that you've enjoyed this afternoon session, and we'll try and get through as many questions as we can. Jeremy. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, everybody, for a really wonderful contributions, uh, a really stimulating afternoon session. We've got a, a half a dozen or so questions, and I think they're sort of divided between those that are probably quite technical and sort of relate to costs, and those that are a bit more broader thinking around community uh, and place. And I'm just wondering whether we should just get the technical ones over and done with, and then we can have a broader conversation. Um, so we've got questions, um, particularly around things like, you know, cost per, per, per foot compared to standard design materials. I'm not sure who Nick is aiming this at. I think it might well be you, Bob. Um, but are the, what are the cost per foot compared to standard design materials? And we've heard in other sessions this week already, you know, uh, uh, construction cost inflation and things. So I'm conscious you developed this, you know, a decade or more ago, and you know the cost then would be different to now. But you did talk about sort of doing some stuff in East Sussex as well at the moment. So perhaps you've got some sort of indicative information you can share us about costs. Um, <clears throat> costs, uh, cost per square foot at the moment are all over the place, and of course they've gone up enormously since we built the Wentles. Um, yeah. what, we're, what we're trying to do is reduce those through uh, an element of simplicity and replication. That's the uh, why the arms house idea is quite good, in that you can, by using an offsite manufacturer, bring some of those costs down. But then again, I feel it's very important to produce somewhere that's very energy efficient and pleasant to live in as well. The, the choice of materials, particularly internally, are important. Um, I, I think at the end of it, it's down to good design. You can actually produce a place that 
is more useful, appears to be bigger than it really is, but uh, in square footage, and yet doesn't cost that extra to produce. So tricky, mm -hmm. tricky question. It's 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 always going to be a problem uh, in some ways, but you do need to spend that money to make it a good place to live. Yeah. No, thanks for that. I mean, I, I was just struck by what Claire Cameron said this morning, and I think she's experiencing, you know, sort of about 30% cost price inflation. I'm not sure, Alex, is that something you're experiencing as well and the cost modeling that you do? Yeah, for sure. And it's hindering a lot of um, urban projects. So there's not only cost inflation, but the Building Safety Act is is driving uh, many changes to the designs of higher density schemes, which is uh, you know reducing the net to gross efficiency and therefore pushing up the cost. I guess um, perhaps part of this, the answer to this question, though, is also lies in sort of the broader uh, cost impacts um, of development. So uh, land being notably a large part of your uh, uh, capital cost equation. And if sites can be better identified, whether it's local authority land or, um, you know, I'm always amazed, even walking around, you know, large parts of London, how many available sites there are quite central uh, for development that seem to be overlooked and underused. So there's huge capacity, I think, within brownfield sites to obviously yes they come with a premium to clean them up sometimes but actually if we can get sort of land values down and i don't know the answer to that <laughs> but um, perhaps less speculation and more kind of development for people actually wanting to own a home rather than speculate on a home might might help well, I'll come to Paula in a minute on this as well, but I'm just struck that another point you made right at the outset of your slides, Alex, was the, the, the health and well-being aspect. And a report that's come out today from the National Housing Federation and Shelter, mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but suggests, you know, that there's actually a dividend to the NHS of about £5.4 billion if we build the right homes, because it will prevent illness and enable to live that health and well-being in later life, through actually throughout the life course, not just an older age. So it sounds like our cost modelling is very much geared to a, a sort of technical build costs and not thinking mm. about the broader health and well-being of society. That's absolutely right. And I think take a particular example, the cost of accidents from falls is yeah. in the billions and or deep treating accidents from from falls. And um, so and that affects those in later life specifically if they're in unsuitable accommodation with steep stairs and uh, where where and obviously our focus in designing new homes is about accessibility and ensuring that they're adaptable for those changing needs. So I, I absolutely support that. And I, I saw the headline for that research. I was keen to follow up and read it. Yeah. And, and Bob mentioned in his intro, you know, I stumbled across the Wintels. Absolutely right. I popped in there. But the other thing about uh, Bishop's Castle, it's one of the first pioneer uh, places where there was social prescribing. And I think you've got a local GP practice that actually operates out of the local cafe and supports building the community resilience, even before you think about your health and well-being. So it's about the self-care and self-management. Uh, so, Bob, I don't know if you, if that sort of percolates through to the Wintels as well. It is a very important element that we reproduce the conditions to make that sort of thing happen. Um, it, it, it's, it's not just the... the um, the GPs, of course, within Bishop's Castle generally, um, there's, it's being an integrated community that has access yeah. to bump into each other on the street. That was the fundamental thing. Make it easy for that, to make a convivial atmosphere for that sort of thing to happen naturally was our aim. And I think, Paula, I mean, that natural approach is, so I remember you and I talking about naturally occurring retirement communities, you know, 20 years ago, and you talking about intergenerational points, both in Scarborough, but also thinking around Telford and Recon. What, what are your thoughts around that sort of broader approach as well? I think the broader approach is, is essential, but I think linking back to the cost question, Jeremy, mm. and the point that you made there about the savings to health, there are good examples of that already. So if you look at you know, North Yorkshire, for example, that was predominantly around social care at the time. But a local authority can put together the business case on, on an investor-save basis. So them savings are there, that if people are living in the appropriate housing setting and then receiving the, the care and support that they need, one, you, you often see an actual decrease in the amount of care and support that somebody requires. 
the ex-care charge board trusted a, an excellent piece of work previously about that, didn't they, demonstrating what the value was. Yep. But the local authority can do that, and that's exactly what we're doing with Telford and Rekin. But we've gone a, a stage further because we've, we've taken it right across the registered service as well as, as the domiciliary service. And the, the financial model that they're putting together is to how can they generate some investment into then getting the accommodation that they require? Because this is the challenge. I don't think it's that there isn't enough. Well, I mean, there isn't enough organisations, but for the organisations that are there that have really got an appetite for doing this and actually making a difference, you know, the, 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 the viability is, is the restriction. You know, that, that's what the challenge is, whether it be land or whether it be the build costs. Those are the restrictions, but it's where I always revert back to. There is a role for local and central government to support this because, you know, there is the potential to generate some huge savings that could create investment that comes back into the sector to make these things happen. And then if you look at standard build costs, yes, we're being bold. You know, we're a house builder and we are focused on, on, a, on a lifelong care ready design that, you know, typically our specification, standard specification, is around 10 to 15%, depending on locality, higher than if we were building a general house. Now, you know, and that's why there's a lot of house builders that won't even entertain this. They won't even take this approach towards it. So I think there are genuine challenges there, and it is going to take, you know, some creativity and boldness, but I do think it's that collaboration. that, that, that There's definitely a better way to spend public funds to create more. Yeah. Coming back to that funding bit, uh, Rob uh, highlights issues around affordability. So obviously, sort of capital investment also has an implication on revenue uh, and affordability of, of schemes. And he talks about things like CLTs for people who don't know. I think that's community land trust. Uh, Bob, I don't think you are a community land trust, if I'm right. Um, but the sort of principles that you apply, are there things around that and other things around sort of trying to create better market value, um, other models? I mean, you have, you have a particular model. Are there other ones that you've explored? Uh, no, we, we started out very much along a community land trust model. But um, when it came to getting the funding to do, develop the site, it, it, it fell, fell apart, I'm afraid. And so we then went off down a much more sort of commercial track in order to get the thing built. Um, but having done that, I think things like community land trusts and this idea of, of, of arms house charities is one that mm. is very well worth exploring. Um, I think at the moment, there's an, an awful lot of different community land trust models and different arms houses, of course, which complicates matters. But a way forward would be to develop a, 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 some process that puts these things together and then uh, finds a tick box within the planning system. That's probably one of the most crucial elements. Yeah, and I know that people like Tom Chance, who runs community land trust networks and, and co-housing and all those sort of things are part of this. And there is a, a Homes England programme, but it's only about £60 million a year. But we need to think about how that can help boost uh, a more diverse uh, supply. Um, Alex, any thoughts about CLTs and other issues around affordability? I know you're building there, the last, the, the, you know, the Morden Centre was more about uh, a community resource, but any, you clearly work across other uh, groups as well. Yeah, we're not working um, in CLTs, although we are doing some custom build development, which uh, is perhaps another way to improve affordability. So uh, residents can, or, or buyer purchasers can kind of choose the level of fit out, um, choices about materials and the finishes of the home uh, or even the size of the home itself so that in that instance we're, we're selling service plots and uh, then albeit with planning uh, for a certain house type but then if a, a buyer wants a smaller house or a cheaper house then uh, they can we, we can just go a sort of planning uh, amendment um, so that's quite an interesting emerging model I think CLTs, custom build, self build are all much more common in the Netherlands and in mainland Europe, um, and sadly still a very small part of the supply chain uh, here. But there are increasingly more models of, um, or examples of CLT, thankfully, happening. 
Mm -hmm. Paula, do you find that the, coming back to the affordability, do, do you find that the institutional investor that you're talking to get this, both in terms of housing for older people, but in, perhaps also for CLTs? Um, we, we don't quite have the German model where our local regional banks may invest in this because they actually are much mm -hmm. more grounded in the sort of citizen lending, for example. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, th I think they do. I, I, I think they do to a certain degree. And, and it's like, you know, anything really, I, th I think that's typical within the, the, the British culture more than anything, I think it is that there is always some red tape that can get in the way, so we're not going to get the utopia. But but there is, there's, there's more and more interest in it. And, and I think, you know, as the co-housing models come along as well, I think what we're, you know, Mary and I have been talking quite recently, for example, on some of the, the larger developments that we've been looking at, of saying, well, we, we should be including this into... The, the offering to the, the the master planning into the shaping, you know, taking Alex's point of, you know, do we create just, you know, a certain number of plots or do we actually then look at, um, you know, from, from the point of view of like Bob's experience of actually, is it that it's built into almost like the town centre of this, that then you navigate out to provide this opportunity for people who want that type of living environment are able then to, to either invest themselves or do we have a model sat behind it, whether that's community land trust or whether that's another investment model. Because I think that's the thing that I'm keen, as you know, and you know I'm exploring at the moment, is how do we attract investors to, in a sense, um, create these, it's, it's almost like a community bank. I can't describe it in any other way. Yeah, yeah, because like the reason yeah. that I describe it that way is about surely we should be able to put some of these funds that are based here um, to better use. You know, it, it, it's safe. It's a safe investment, but how can we have it on a sort of a, a deposit and withdrawal type of thing, which is why I refer to it as a community bank. And I think, you know, if we can crack some of that thinking and that modelling that we're looking at at the moment, that again provides different avenue where, you know, we, we have a different level of affordability for somebody, just the same as we have done with, you know, with our for sale market model, that is purely, as you know, open market sale. There's no service charge. Everything's adopted that isn't within the customer's boundary, you know, and it's breaking that that model. And that works for, for some people. But for other people, they don't. They want the more, you know, cohesive and, and altogether approach. So, um, yeah, I think we can go further, but at least there's a glimmer of hope because the conversations are going well. Nick from Cohabit House, who's, who's written some blogs for the Lynn and welcome, uh, talks. I think he sort of touches on scalability and he talks about the facilities and amenities depending having a large depend on having a large number of users. What do the panel think is an optimal mm -hmm. size? Um, and Bob, hi Bob, uh, you also talk about you know about the in reach of, and about attracting of a broad range of, uh, of residents uh, and citizens and, and in, in the locality. Are there any points around that that both in terms of uh, diverse communities as well as scalability that uh, you, you have any thoughts on? Paula, do you, do you want to kick off with that, and I'll come to to Bob and then Alex. Yeah, because the, the scale thing is absolutely a crucial question because it, it's it's where in a sense, is that that liability going to sit? So when you're a developer and you're looking at this, you know, with, whether it be the co-housing group or or another group, um, ideally, and I think if we talk about in an ideal world, this is where intergeneral placemaking really does come into its own because that's where we should be looking at, you know, what is the community community facilities that are needed within a within any community. Um, for for it, it, it to, in a sense, have that longevity, have that flexibility of whether it be service provision, whether it be amenities, whether it be mm -hmm. facilities themselves. Um, so I think, I think there's an opportunity there from a scalability point of view is, again, I think it's whether it's, it's developer-led or whether it starts to become more policy-led, that there is a requirement to do that and the requirement to think about that and demonstrate because... Ultimately, yes, that deals with your capital cost, but you need to then going to need to look at that that community cohort of who's going to take responsibility for running it. So, is that going to be an organisation of whether that's you know the land trust or, or the the housing association or or the local authority, or actually is it going to be volunteer led? Is this about social investment from people themselves within the community? We've got a little bit of this going on in Scarborough at the moment where. 
there are actually ex-parish councillors who have got fed up of things not happening, that they've joined forces and now they're going to open a farm shop because the farm, you know, there isn't a shop there. And they've, they've, t they've in a sense, empowered themselves, which I think is fantastic. And all we've done is, is in a sense, is, is provide the platform to do it. So I think, there's, again, there's, there's different models and it's never going to be one size fits all. I think it's difficult to say you need X amount of units because if we looked at a rural setting, you're not going to achieve that. So it has to be applicable to the locality. But it will really come down to that engagement. That, that's what I just see is it's engagement and who, and who are the stakeholders. And uh, I mean, you, you do have a community shop and the like in, in Bishop's Castle. Any thoughts about scalability and, and diverse communities? It, it's a it's a complex uh, answer to quite a simple question, I suppose. I mean, the Bishop's Castle, for example, is quite isolated, and so um, that means that uh, the local shops and the local pubs particularly survive, whereas they might not if it was better connected. But there's also um, anthropological research that says a, a neighbourhood of sort of 40, 50 houses or households is quite a good one because it's related to the number of people's faces that you can remember and as human beings that we can get on with. And so what we did for the Wentels was we split those generally into sort of different clusters of about 12 households because those are the ones that can meet together without having a formal sort of setup mm -hmm. and directors and this, that and the other. And they can, it, it, they can get around a kitchen table and decide what's going to happen with that bit in the middle. And they still own that bit in the middle through the um, uh, through the residents association. And that seems to work quite well. Um, but it, this this it, and I think that if you're developing a much larger site, then it's a good idea to keep uh, keep in mind that sort of 50 odd households, because mm -hmm. that could, that could drive the phasing within a particular development. And then you have I, the the neighborhood identity within those those uh, 50 or so clusters which is i think an important element yes yeah, so that's what struck me when i walked around uh, uh, did my mystery shopping <laughs> as you say earlier this year uh, last year uh, alex any any final points on this one well i was i was going to mention a very similar number actually um but i guess even on smaller schemes in the context of our work, which is largely urban and apartment living, think about how circulation can be enriched to be a space to meet neighbours and sit and chat. It isn't just a means to get from the street to your front door. Yeah. Um, so we design in generous entrance lobbies. Um, the, the green building I showed in Westminster you have to get, in order to get to the lift and, and stair course, you have to go through a large living room. That is the entrance. And, and so actually that space you have to design in anyway, make it a little bit bigger, and it becomes a space for yeah. social social networking and, and community. And then, of course, as you build up the numbers, uh, you can support those uh, other facilities. The other sort of example that we're currently working on, an arms house in South London, where actually we're talking to a local community group who have facilities in the area that they can't really, uh, haven't got the financial means to properly sustain. So actually by co-locating that with the facilities of the arms house, actually potentially bring together communities, bring together age groups, and actually the... the, the um, landlord as it were the stewards can um you know better manage that between them thank you look i'm going to draw this to a close but i have one final question really and it picks up on a question that abdul has spun us um as well as mary's point that i think she talked about a changing narrative and that is do, do we need to change the language around retirement living um so uh, paula i'll kick off with you um and then come back to alex and then to, to bob yeah, absolutely agree. Um, Abdul knows we've, we've talked about this many occasions. Uh, absolutely agree. We do need to change the narrative. The challenge is to what? You know, so it's we do, we purposely took the retirement bit out of ours. But as you see, we've, we've been stuck with later living. Um, we're looking at rebranding at the moment. But again, it's driven by a lot of the consent you get. So when you go in for a planning and you want to do a certain thing, you'll be driven by a certain policy. So it is, it is difficult, but I absolutely agree we should be changing the narrative. Shouldn't be talking about downsizing, it's about right-sizing, because it's about what's right for you. And it should be about living, not about later living. So absolutely agree there. Alex? 
Uh, well, I can't I can't uh, beat that. I think Paula said it. Um, yeah, the, the needs, the, it would help if there was more consolidation of the terminology. So just on the Westminster scheme, I showed one of the difficulties there was convincing uh, the planning authority that uh, there was one that there was a need for specialist uh, housing for for older people, um, but also that it, because it wasn't institutional care. Um, it ended up falling into sui generis and uh, that led to a kind of uh, you know, negotiations and around affordable housing contribution and so on. So it's unclear and um, there does need to be further thought. So maybe that's something for the DLUC Older People's Task Force. We, we yeah, absolutely. That back to I yeah, yeah, I think that's something she's keen to do. Bob, any, any final thoughts before I hand back to Paula? It's um it's a question of uh, a planning box to tick. Um, at the moment, there doesn't seem really seem to be one. Um, and after giving it a lot of thought on our side, we've just called our well originally called ourselves Living Villages as the Living Village Trust, and then Village Makers because it seemed that word village is the one that summed up what we wanted to do. And certainly, when you mentioned arms houses, oh that's for poor people. You mentioned co housing, well I'm sorry to say that oh usually comes out oh that's for hippies. And there's just nothing <laughs> nothing in between. But in fact it's actually a very natural thing. It's the most natural thing in the world. Um, and so it should be there, but uh, as the planning system doesn't seem to accept that there is this, this way of living that everyone is, is tuned into doing. Well, we'll come back to that uh, in, in a session later on this week uh, with, with some planners, but I'm gonna hand back to Paula just to say a few words and then I'll conclude shortly. Thank you very much, Gemma. And yes, just, just very briefly there, I think, you know, Taking that on board, it is definitely more about appropriate housing than everything else isn't it? when we're actually labelling it. But we are a society that's driven by labels, unfortunately. Uh, I would love to see everybody continue the conversation. So please don't let's just stop the conversation now at the end of the session. Um, obviously, um, Sally and Jerome will be sharing the information. More than happy, as I'm sure the other speakers are, for everybody to reach out to us and continue the conversation. Big, big thank you to Jeremy and the team for facilitating a game, which is just an absolutely fabulous summit. We look forward to all getting back together again very soon. Thank you, Paul. And thank you. Thank you for your support. Uh, for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with the rest of the programme, we're going to pick up on some of these issues again tomorrow morning when we're looking at issues around diversity and choice um, uh, with uh, with Housing 21 and some of their developments around co-housing and placemaking, alongside work with Open University and the Bangla Housing Association around the Bangladeshi community uh, in East London, and also some new research that's just been published uh, and a video that they've shared uh, by the DEMEC project at the University of Worcester, looking at issues that Julianne highlighted in her opening presentation around dementia-friendly communities and extra care housing. So we'll be picking up quite a few of these themes tomorrow and beyond. But can I just thank uh, Paula and the team uh, at the Love All Later Living uh, for, for their support uh, this year. Uh, can I thank Julianne, Alex, Bob um, and Mary uh, for four fantastic uh, presentations. If other people would like to speak at future housing LIN events, please do let us know the email um, address supplied here. Uh, if you'd like to support and sponsor us in other ways uh, or engage with our team to help you develop your strategies and plans, let us know too. Um, and again, uh, we look forward to hearing from you, whether through our networked activities or other activities uh, in, 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 in the weeks and months to come. Uh, but for now, can I just thank you and the team behind the scenes for putting on such an excellent event. Um, and we look forward to seeing you, I hope, again, either tomorrow at our sessions or as Paula suggested, let's keep this conversation going, a really rich quality discussion that we've had this afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for your fantastic contribution. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Cheers.